That's not the way I saw. One child was blind in the eye. And the rags of my sin, sorry, wretched and Right here, we'll make room for high for the brown, and we'll make room to get you. If you want to go up on the stairs and up, up around here, that'd be great. And come on in here. And brother, Mrs. Nass, we're glad that chair right there. That's for you folks, right? I'm, well, you're 40 years old now. Uh, we're so glad you're here, all of you. On the count of three, tell me who you are, where you're from. One, two, three. Well, one more song with me, and Brother Martinez, you lead us for a while here. How about the page, no, no, song number three? Because every, but this is yours to keep, so bring it tomorrow night, all right? Don't we have any more of these around? Yes. We have some, who needs a booklet? Who needs a booklet? Right there. Pastor, we'll get it to you. Who else needs a booklet? Who has them? Nicholas? Nicholas is our famous undertaker. He works for the mortuary here in college. Oh, boy. I don't know if you want your daughter to date him. I'm not sure about that. Sing it together. How are
number five, number song, number five years. Brother Martinez singing the first stanza. Don't rush it. We're going to come on in. Got it there. Oh, years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not, and knowing not as for me. Yes! Calvary, sing mercy, there was great heart, and there was multiplied to me, there my burden so found the Calvary, all the love that to salvation. I feel good already. I, I'm starting to feel it now. We're not even in church yet. We're just out here. How about song number 47? Oh, don't get too happy now because we're going to be singing, I'll fly away. Oh, I'll fly away. Oh, yeah. Some glad morning. When this life is all sad. And some glad morning. When this life is o'er, yes, to uh, on God's celestial shore, I'll sing it away, oh, I fly away, oh, glory, I'll fly in the morning way. is going to be. How many of you have loved ones in heaven already? Oh yeah, they're way up there already waiting for us. But how about number 49? You may ask me where I'm headed. <laughs> you may ask me where I'm bound. Well, I'm bound for that kingdom of the happy and the free. How about that first? Lift it up. Sing it out. Do you may ask me where I'm headed. Come on, come on. Yes. Oh, well, I'm going to a country across the sea. And I know how. Oh, well, I'm bound for the kingdom. Get behind that car. Sing it out. Yeah, somehow. Coming after me. 
country where they stay well. Ah, tell me at last. Yes, I'll know I'll live forever. Oh, yes. For the kingdom of the free. Set it out! Oh, well, I'm bound for the kingdom, yes! And the free. And my Jesus soon is coming. say amen we're in church now oh yes how many of you favorite song brother uh uh let me see here i'm calling around who favorite song brother kevin what's your favorite song church song oh, you love them all even elvis song amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost, but now I'm found. Sing it out on the first. Amazing grace, how sweet <laughs> that saved. Song number 82. My goodness. 
We should buy a couple buses and start traveling. Amen. Maybe uh, uh, make some CDs and start selling them, all right? Y'all recording artists this morning, I guess. Oh, look at this. Oh, I want to see him on the first. As I journey through the land, singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson core. Many arrows pierce my soul from without. But my Lord, lead me on. Ah, you're watching. Through him. All together now. And oh, I want to see. Yes. Have at it. Have at it. Sing on. All the saving grace and on the streets of gold. Start us off on that second verse. All the ladies now say, Who went before me? All right, ladies. Men, let's show them how to do it right. All the men, lift it up. Yeah. To this world belong. And he's a real friend to me. Oh, I love. Shut it out! Oh, I want to see it. Look up on and there to sing forever. On the streets of glory, let me live my voice. Cares all past, home and Song number 91. This is probably song before service, all right? Sing it from your heart. How many blessed? How many blessed? You're just blessed. Oh, yeah. 
91, song number 91. Sing it out, sing it out right here. When I look around and see the good things he has done, I know I'm unworthy of Woo! Yes! All the blessing he freely gave up for my life. Here it is! To
This is the day we have been waiting for so very long, and we're excited that you're here, and I thank God for you. I thought of, again, today, all the expense that you put into just getting to this place, and we're going to have a wonderful week together, and I hope that you uh, realize that we love you. We appreciate you so very much. I want to remind you something I heard at a conference about 40 years ago. The preacher stood up and he said this. He said, this is like a smorgasbord. And he said, when I say a smorgasbord, he said, you can go through the, uh, the line and get as much food as you want. But if you see something you don't like, don't spit on it. Because somebody's coming right after you that likes that food right there. And if you've come to analyze, oh, I can give you a lot more. It, it said, someone said to me, you know, Brother Traver, I'll tell you about you. I said, you ought to talk to my wife. You, you don't have, know half as much as she knows about me. She could tell you a whole bunch more than you just did. And a lady came to the door back here, and she said uh, years ago, she said, you have beady eyes. <laughs> I felt like saying you have bad breath, but I didn't. Why? <laughs> Good. You have beady eyes. Can you believe that? Our church knows this. I've told them. I, uh, right before pastor's conference, oh, about four or five years ago, I was riding my bicycle and went down a, a hill and went over the top of the handlebars, broke some ribs and smashed my face up and had stitches up here above my eye. And then the next year at Christmas, I did it on a little scooter in the street, went up in the air and came back down and did this eye. And a lady from North Carolina, you North Carolina folks, she said, she said this. She said, at the door. How you doing, Brother Treber? And I said, are you looking for the scars? And she said, I am. I said, they're right here and here. I thought that was the end of it, but no, not with this dear lady. She said, you know what? They did a good job. It blends in with the other lines as well. <laughs> and then she caught herself there. We're so glad you're here. Page 25, let's stand together, sing with Brother Martinez, get your vocal cords up and ready to go. Page number 25. 25. Oh, yes, turn it up, God's people. It's the place where you can sing as loud as you can and nobody's going to stop you. On the first, lift it up, sing it out. Ha.
Pastors and Workers Conference. It's a joy and an honor to have each and every one of you in attendance. This conference is like a family reunion, and it is so good to see so many uh, familiar faces, and uh, it's also great to see so many generational Christians here and churches returning. Thank you for joining us, and I know several of you are here in the state of California for the first time. And so we welcome you to California. We welcome you to North Valley Baptist Church. We're looking forward to a great week together. Yesterday was a powerful kickoff to, for the early birds. And Pastor Treber preached from Colossians chapter 2. And then Brother Tony Hudson preached last night on the book of Job. And I would encourage every one of you to listen to those messages. Last night's message would be an encouragement to your heart. And uh, we're looking forward to God working in our lives this week together. It's our prayer that God would strengthen you and revive you this week in every session and every service. And so let's commit this service to the Lord in this conference and ask God to work in our midst together tonight. Our Father, what a joy it is to be here with your people and to think about the men of God who've come from across the country and around the globe. And Lord, every church that represents uh, you here and every church that's represented here, Father, we want this meeting to breathe life into them spiritually. And I pray, God, that every person would leave here encouraged, challenged, and convicted. And God, we commit this conference to you. I pray, Lord, that the Word of God would be magnified. God, that you would take control of this service, that your Spirit, Lord, would lead in every service and in every session. And I pray, God, that we would leave here conformed to the image of Christ with more vigor and fire to serve you in this day and hour than ever before. Move in our midst tonight as we open your word. I pray that you'd use the preaching of your word, God, in a powerful way to speak to every heart and every life. And we'll be careful to give you the glory and the praise. For we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated.
Praise God. How about 267, please? When I think of all my faults and all my failures. Excuse me. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Sing that first. When I think of all my faults. Yes. When I can say says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. America tonight has rejected God. And because of that, we are reaping the consequences. There's hopelessness everywhere you look. Depression, discouragement, sadness. Think of the drug addiction that we find even on the streets of our city. People living in gutters. People that are laying on the sidewalks. Needles. Think of crying, breaking up windows and destroying property. There's disrespect for authority. Our police are considered the enemies. America's debt is out of control. Our legal system, our judges, the politics, the invasion of illegal immigrants. When we think of all that's happening, it's very obvious we're in trouble. So America looks for answers. Where do we go? Well, we go to Hollywood. Well, those are many empty people. And maybe we can find happiness in our stadiums, but we go way empty. The malls are filled, especially with young people looking for something in life. And our social media, it is out of control. And everyone, it seems like, is on some type of device, but not in the present, talking to others. The self-life is in. It's, we're a selfie society. And all this only adds to our destruction. In order to discover why we have these problems we need to look at the root what is the root it's very obvious the root is the rejection of god we have determined in this country that we don't need god and i lay the fault of the condition of our country at the feet of pastors pastors like me and pastors like you and God's people. 
And I love God's people. They're absolutely the best. But if we're not careful, we become so casual with God. In Jeremiah 8, 9, the Word of God says they've rejected the Word of the Lord. The Bible says in Hosea 4, hear the Word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. The Lord hath a controversy uh, with the land because there's no truth or mercy our knowledge of God the land by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery uh, they break out blood toucheth blood my people destroy for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge I will also reject thee thou shalt be no priest to me seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God I will also forget thy children our children are gonna reap the consequences of our carnality. America today has over 380,000 churches. And yet the vast majority of those churches are dark on Sunday night, they're closed. How in the world do we spend millions of dollars on buildings and properties and then we close them all week long, one and done. I did my one hour with God Sunday morning. So we don't need Sunday school anymore. We just do our one hour. And to make it convenient for people so you have the weekend, we'll give you a Saturday night service. Or now, the big uh, event is a Friday night service. And I've even seen Thursday night services. So you people don't have to do all this God stuff. My Bible says it's so much the more. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves again. So much the more as you see the day approaching. I wonder what it must look like to God on a Sunday night when buildings are dark, when He's the light of the world. The majority of our churches have a social gospel, a diverse gospel. Prayer meetings have ceased. Getting the gospel out door to door, it's, it's just sharing with people at the most or giving an invitation. But what about the gospel? Well, what about the great hymns of the faith? Or what about the songs about the blood and about Calvary? We have replaced now in our churches dignity for casual. We want to relate to the society. We want to relate to the community. And so we dress cool and hip. A lot of times uh, the blue jeans and the, uh, the, the sport coat and the t-shirt and the, and, and the tennis shoes. I can't see a high priest dressing that way. I can't see a man of God dressing that way. What's the hope we have? If my people. That begins with preachers, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way. God's people, God's men, so the hope for righteousness exalteth a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people tonight. I plead with you. We talk about revival, but it must begin here. The songwriter said, Do you really want revival? Do you really want God's power? Do you really want His Spirit to control your life, my life this hour? Or repent and turn to Jesus. Do it now without delay. Do you really want revival? Are you willing? Am I willing to obey? Yes, I really want revival. I grew up about 15 minutes from here. We would have revival meetings. And in my estimation, they were great meetings, great preachers. I had a great church. But I've never seen a revival in my life. I went to a great Bible college. I've been pastoring this church 48 years. We've had great meetings. I've never seen a revival. Many years ago, I had several men on my deacon board, and one of those men was my dad. He's been with the Lord for many years now. And I said, fellas, a lot of you fellas are old and older than I am. You're in their 70s and 80s. Let's talk about revival. 
I said, how many of you have ever seen a revival? Not one hand went up. They said, we've had great evangelistic meetings, we've had great movies, we've had some people saved. There was one older man at that time, he raised his hands, my dad, my dad never talked at deacon's meetings. He didn't feel like it was his place, he just sat there and listened. He said, son, I had experienced a revival one time. I said, could you tell us about it? He said, a man came to town. They'd preach every day. In the morning, most of us men were at the farm or at the factory at work. Different folks would go as they could go. And at night, every night, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then a Sunday again. And he said, you know, we went all eight days, and the preacher said, I believe God hasn't sent revival yet, but I believe he wants to. He said, let's go another week. And they did that another week for two weeks, and then three weeks, and then four weeks, and then five weeks. And they said, son, the sixth week, something happened. I said, who was that man? His name was Evangelist John R. Rice. He said, we saw revival. I long for revival before I die. I long to see something happen. When our vice president this week, this, this day came out, and just ridiculed and scoffed Israel. We're in trouble. She's one heartbeat away from the presidency. Scoffs and mocks Israel. We have our cities legislating everything about sin, about as far, as far wrong as you can get. That's what they want. The transvestite would be more popular than a Baptist preacher. What a, what a sad day. I believe God still can send revival. The people in North Valley Baptist Church, I know we preach, we believe Jesus is coming again, but I also believe this. I believe God is willing to send one more revival. It's in his character because he knows when the trump sounds and the tribulation begins and those 21 judgments and that Armageddon begins in Israel, very few will come to know Christ. And it's in the character of God because he said he's not willing that any should perish. You know where revival could begin this week? Right here in Santa Clara, California. And I know liberal, wicked California. It reminds me a lot of your city. And your state. And your country. We may lead the way, and I don't say that with humor. We may lead the way. I love this California preaching because quite frankly, we send missionaries to the mission field. These men of God and women of God are on the mission field. And how it goes California is how it goes the nation. Do you want revival? I hope you do. I would ask you to plead for it this week. Let's stand together and sing that last stanza. Yes, I really want revival. Yes, I really want God's power. Let's sing it together on that last stanza. Yes, I really. Yes, I really want. Yes, I really want His
I'll ask Brother Hudson to lead us in prayer for a revival tonight. I mean, sometimes my wife and I talk, we get tired sometimes of hearing everybody wants a revival. Well, let's just have it. And quite frankly, I don't know how badly you need it. I get weary with me. I need revival. You know, there's the world that just is always there. And the flesh that's always there. My own, my own self, always there. And, and God wants to speak to me and deal with me. Brother Tony, your dad preached the first meeting here 39 years ago. Brother Tom Apusin, he's on the platform somewhere he's right here, I think. Got saved that day. He's been on our staff. He was a prison guard. And he went off to Bible college and came back and married one of our bus girls. And they've raised a family. And all these years he's been here. Will you come and lead us in prayer, Brother Tony? Pray God that he'll pray to God that he'll do something special this week, please. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the promises of your word. And, uh, that they're sure and amen. And Lord, we stand in need. It's not in debate whether our churches need revival. This Laodicean age is cold and indifferent. And the Lord, as we study the Bible, we, we're aware that we are victims of prophecy. You said it's going to get worse and worse. Evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. But Lord, help us not to be victimized by the prophecy. I pray tonight for every church represented here, churches in the country, churches on Main Street, churches in the foreign soil, churches well known and churches that are Hit away. I pray tonight you'd stir the pastors that are here. And the many that are listening by way of the internet access, I pray tonight you'd stir their hearts and create a want to and an appetite. You said, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And you'll answer us. And I pray now for every person present and those, Lord, that, that Lord, are seeking this revival. I pray we wouldn't be satisfied with anything less. Help us to press toward the mark and the prize of the high calling in these last days. And as we sit here this week under preaching, even tonight, I pray you'd fill the preacher with the Holy Ghost. And not only do we ask you to fill him to preach your word, but help us to be filled to hear the word and predetermined to make application of what we hear. Let us predetermine to leave these walls to make a difference. And Lord, we can. You wouldn't have left us here if we couldn't. And Lord, we would be naive to think everybody here tonight saved. What a tragedy to be in an atmosphere like this and leave lost and undone. I pray old time Holy Ghost conviction would make sinners aware of the brevity of life. And let them be aware that this may be their last time to be in an atmosphere where God's words preach and let them be saved. Let tonight be the last night they're lost. Use these men that preach, use these men that hear. And we'll ask you blessed upon every activity of this week. For in Jesus' name we pray and may long live old time religion till you come. Amen. 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 You may be seated. much the same. I see a place where I have never been before. With pearly white gates and a father who waits just inside the door. What's that I hear? Is that the sound
this old world has lost its charm. It's no place for me. It's that white shining throne in that new home that I long to see. So I'll spend my days in much the same way. I'll wait for the sound. And soon my hand
Thank you so much. It's time for the offering. The happy time right now. And to our people, I want to just challenge you again, as I said yesterday, I'm really looking for about 40 people to throw in an extra $500 this week and uh, 2025 to throw in a thousand and many below that and some I've been praying for 10,000. A conference like this is so very expensive and uh, the delegates have paid and so we realize that there's tuition but it's going to go way beyond that. I think you'll see it this week and so if uh, our people especially uh, could do something. You know I got a letter in the mail Saturday right here and uh, Brother Kavanaugh from Northwest Bible Baptist Church in Chicago area, uh, Elgin. And he wrote me just the nicest letter. That he had a great delegation here last year. Pastor, Brother Brother, um, Brother Gomez pastored there for so long. He said, we won't be able to attend the conference this year, but I want to help. And here's a large check of $500. So there's somebody right there. Amen. And that's a good church. They're just celebrating 50 years since it was established last month. And to God be the glory. Ushers, please come. And I hope we can do something big, our church family especially, and rich pastors. There goes the offering. Nothing's coming in, I guarantee it. I hope I get to meet you this week. Uh, we have the convention center, and it's you, you have to go out there tonight and we'll line up in there and we'll go eat dinner afterwards tonight Italian food but um, there's a coffee shop out there tomorrow we've outgrown the Golden Grill so we'll be in the gymnasium and uh, and I hope that you'll let me talk to you and find out who you are and help me with your name and help me to know who you are if I've not met you while we're here our other property is literally packed tonight we have the Spanish conference going on. We have one preacher night. They have two preachers a night. And then carnasada every night and everything else. I said to the Spanish pastor, we were meeting this morning. I said, Brother Sloan, now tell me about last night. We got out. It was, I think, a few minutes after 8, maybe before 8. And uh, we started at 6. And uh, they got out at 9.15, but he said, then we stayed in 8 till about 11.15. Thank you, Lord, for not allowing me to be born in Mexico. Uh, I love preaching, but I don't know if I love it that much. I mean, come on, can overdo some things, too. And uh, so they're having their meeting tonight. They had a great meeting. They had many saved and baptized yesterday. And to God be the glory. Well, Brother Fenera, come and lead us in prayer for a good offering uh, this week and tonight. We begin it, please. Lord, what a joy it is to be here this evening, Lord, to be able to gather with so many men and women of God. Lord, to lift up your holy name, to hear the preaching of your word tonight. God, we're so thankful for our salvation and for the blessings that you've given us in our lives. I pray that tonight we'd give back to you as you'd given to us. Lord, help our church family tonight to give liberally, Lord, when we think of the great investment into the lives of the servants of God. And Lord, I pray that you would take this offering and bless it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.
So I'll ask Mrs. Trevor to come and help me, if you will, and to bring, if you will, Chiago and Natalia and Cindy, and bring, if you will, Brian and Searcy. Mrs. Trevor has this book. It's out. Uh, it's two books. One is one from years ago when our kids were young in our home, when we were raising them. It has some pictures when they were young kids. All three of our kids are now grown. We have 14 grandkids. They're all in the ministry. Our son, Brother Tim, and his wife, Rebecca, are here pastoring in Arizona. Our son-in-law, Brother Ryan and Tiffany, they're mar married 24 years. They're in Southern California pastoring a large ministry. And the man just prayed. My son-in-law has been in our school teaching there for 17 years, our principal. And he began the second grade. His family got saved here and went through elementary, junior high, high school, college. Been married all these years, four kids. He's got two boys getting ready to graduate high school. And uh, life goes on. Well, well, this book is sold out. And so Brother Ramers, uh, who's the head of the publications here, he said, I want you to add some chapters. And she's added three or four. And I've read them. And, it, it, and she says, it's, uh, the book is with all my heart. And the first part of the book is the beginning of the journey. And now it's entitled, these chapters, Continuing the Journey. We like what we're doing. Amen. And God's allowed me to surround myself with some folks that are older than I am. And many that are about my age. And many that are in their 50s and 60s and 50s and 40s and 30s and 20s. That's how we get to keep on going. They've worked so hard around. Well, Chiago, as I open this up, Mr. Treber put a picture of you and your wife and Cindy. I'd like you and Natalia and Cindy to come, and then you're off to work tonight. I know you're supposed to be at work now. Uh, what a wonderful family. They escaped another country years ago. It seen his family murdered, shot on the streets, and killed. It's an awful thing, the way they had to grow up, both of them. They fled to America, got asylum here and uh, went to Northern California and he lived in a tent on a field so he could work there. It's just a, it's a sad, sad thing. And God brought them here on Easter several years ago and they have become like family. In fact, I saw your picture here. I call him my, my son and I see him and I love them. They got saved here, got married here. Tell us just a little bit of your testimony, will you please? Love yes. you. You'll be fine. You'll be yeah. great. I, By the way, yeah, he'll get going. He just he's, he's, he went to our soul winning clinic in January. He's brought 11 adults that are in our class now. Some are here tonight. Just got saved in the last five weeks. All Thank for Brother Rick Valley. Yeah, amen. God bless you. Real so, close that microphone. Yeah, I came from Brazil in 2015 seeking asylum after I had my brother murdered and my uncle they were shot and they tried to shoot me too but by the grace of the lord i could get away and the lord allowed me to come to the united states seeking asylum legally and by the grace yeah, it's possible I, I i promise you and i had the joy to come here and meet my wife she came the same year but we, we are from, we are from a different state in brazil but we had the joy to meet here and we decided to live together and I knew that the way we were living our life was like our family was set up for failure. And then we decided to look for a church. And we went to several churches here in Silicon Valley and none of the church like seemed to be a help to our family. We went to a church that the pastor was a TV screen. <laughs> so we need pastors, right? So we went to another church that was a rock band and like everything dark was pretty similar to the, 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 the life we were living. So we want some change in our lives. And we found the church, my wife saw the steeple. And we decided to come. And we, we came here and the same day, the pastor made an invitation and my wife just disappeared in the crowd. <laughs> I was kind of concerned, where's my wife? And then when I, when I found her, she was in the, getting baptized already. <laughs> <laughs> so, my, so as a man, I forgot I followed my wife. Uh, 
Mrs. Mrs. Strieber gave the, the gospel to her and she immediately got saved and got baptized. And the following week, I got baptized too and got saved. And Mrs. Strieber helped us so much in this journey. She, she arranged our wedding after Brother Luke was Thank getting God. married here the same night. She said, Tiago, you want to marry Natalia? It was in front of her, so I could not say no. <laughs> <laughs> I say yes. Okay, we yeah, have a wedding Saturday, so you come ready for it. And that's how it, it was, and I had no choice. <laughs> uh, I can't lie here, <laughs> but it was a great choice. <laughs> so, You're going and, deeper, brother. And then. <laughs> And then, since then, Mrs. Strieber invested so much in our lives. And, you know, we named our, uh, our daughter after Mrs. Strieber. She called Cindy Alves. We named us uh, after Mrs. Strieber, like C-I-N-D-I-E. <laughs> so it's been a blessing, like, being part of this church. I can't believe the transformation that God made in our lives. Thank you. Pastor wife, Mrs. Reber, and one more time, we need the pastors, yeah. real pastors, yeah. and pastor's wife. And I love this couple, and we'll be in counseling this week about his marriage, right? Yeah. Chagos, great advice, Cindy. Cindy spelled the same way, and just, you know, uh, the, the thing about it is, Miss Reber invested in our kids a lot, and still does. Uh, she invests literally every day still in that couple. It's been about six years, I think, for them now. Text them, checks on them. What do you need? How can we help? God brought Brian and Searcy to us. Can you come on up here? They've been here less than a year. Just an amazing as they walked in this place and what God's done in their life. I'll let you tell the story, if you will, please. Go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm Brian Betke. This is my wife, Searcy, and um, we were uh, playing tennis over in the, uh, in the tennis courts over there about nine months ago, and um, we found this church. But the crazy thing is it, this, our story is, is wild, and I'll give you just a, a brief synopsis. Is, um, um, I'm five years sober from alcohol, and uh, yes, thank you. And, um, but I, I grew up, I was adopted and I, I grew up in a, in a loving home. I was saved at a, at a young age. And um, through my high school years, and they were great. And uh, I, uh, Brother Hudson, I, I don't think I ever saw my, my parents sin either and, until I made them because of my actions. <laughs> um, but that's the truth. I, I really didn't. I grew up in a, in a great home. Um, and uh, I, I ruined a lot of relationships through alcohol. Um, but I, I, went to, I went to Cedarville University in Ohio. It's a Baptist college um, for a short, short while because the music industry was calling my name. And uh, so I told my parents, yeah, I'm going to be the rock star. And they were like, right. And, uh, <laughs> so I, I ended up quitting, but I was presented with a record deal. And, um, and it was, it was great for a while. Um, and uh, God provided me everything I needed, except I didn't feel like I needed him, you know? Um, I backslid. I had, I, I had everything I wanted, so I thought. So I felt that, I feel that void with alcohol. And, um, and I, I met the wrong girl. I married the wrong girl super young, and it was really dumb, and, and uh, my parents didn't approve of that, and so long story short is um, I just filled that void with drinking, and, and even though I was saved, I never lost my faith, even though I was a wreck, you know, um, but I still believed, and I still told people, and it was just me personally that was having my own, my own struggles. Um, so I got out of that relationship, and I, I moved back to Pittsburgh. I left her, and I left everything, and I'm starting fresh. And, uh, but I continued drinking. And um, so I, I finally thought I hit rock bottom. I went to rehab, I was there for four months, inpatient. 
And I was like, yeah, this is great. Like, I'm new. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm a new man. And I get out, and I have uh, some friends over uh, for a Steelers game, because originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And, um, and so I had a buddy over, and he said, hey, can I bring a friend? Um, she's a travel nurse, and she's in town. Sweet. Yeah, let's do it. And uh, so I, I got the pizza ready. No alcohol in my house. I'm really I'm proud of myself. And, and uh, in through the door walks this girl, <laughs> kicks her boots off, and comes right over and sits down. She's like, hi, I'm Searcy. And I'm like, oh, man, who's this? I knew I was in trouble. But uh, she, sorry. I told, I told her, I said, hey, if I embarrass you. <laughs> but um, so at this time, I still wasn't drinking, but I, I, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't keep it. I couldn't keep it sober. Um, Seriously, doesn't drink, doesn't do anything bad, in my eyes. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I relapsed that year, and that year was a, a wild year. And, um, and uh, she stayed by my side for some reason. Don't know why, but I'm a lucky man. And uh, she begged me to go back to rehab, begged me to go to the hospital. I didn't until it was almost too late. Um, and I went to the hospital, and fast forwarding through all the details, uh, they gave me 10 weeks to live. Um, kidney transplant list, liver transplant list, uh, as yellow as the sun, these pews. And uh, I was dying. And um, Circe and I were together, but um, at the time, Circe wasn't saved. And um, my parents, again, didn't agree with our relationship, but that's okay. And um, I loved who I loved, and, uh, but God used both of us, and in, in the sense of that, I was, I had a team of 20 doctors trying to keep me alive, and they were at the point of going to give me uh, end-of-life care, done, but God put inside of Circe to put a drain in my gallbladder, and that night, which, that wasn't on their radar, so it came out of almost nowhere. And, but seriously made the call, and, and that's what saved my life that night. And um, so I was discharged. Uh, I, I, I wasn't, it took a long time to get better. I'll just fast forward. And then I was finally discharged, uh, but it wasn't out of the woods yet. I was on dialysis. Um, I was on every, when I was in the hospital, I was on every tube, every pump known to man, knocked out. I was out for like, I don't know, how many months, five months, something like that. But um, 260 pounds down to 120, I was like a skeleton. And, um, uh, but yeah, I, I was discharged after I finally learned to walk again and everything, but I wasn't out of the woods, I was still yellow, still on dialysis three days a week. Was gonna be on dialysis for the rest of my life. Um, I went to have, uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with dialysis in here, but you can have a fistula, a fistula surgery, and so you can, be an active person on dialysis and live a pretty no, fairly normal life on that. Um, so I just faced the facts that I was going to be on dialysis, and that's that. And my doctor called me. I went and got the skin, the, the drafting for it done, and uh, she said, "Are you sitting down?" And I said, "Not yet." She goes, "Well, you better." She said, "Because we just we just got the the charting back and." you're, you're going to be completely off of dialysis. You don't need anything. And so I had no transplants, nothing. The Lord, the Lord healed me. I had doctors tell me, yes, praise God, right? He, the, I had a doctor, a couple doctors tell me, you know, we don't like to bring religion or God into any of this. But something bigger than us saved you. And so I, uh, I was so thankful for that, and so after, the, after that year, and putting seriously through that, she and I took a little bit of a break, because I needed to prove myself that I was going to be the man I said I was going to be, because I, I certainly wasn't, but then I did prove myself, and she called me, or texted me, I was watching the Pirates game, and she texted me, and I, I almost lost my marbles, I was so excited, and, uh, and so we hung out, and, and we got back together, and and Circe, Circe is just amazing. She saved my life. And coming to this church, when we found this tennis court, because we love playing tennis, you know, we weren't going to church. 
I mentioned going to church many times and I could see it was kind of on her radar and one day we were playing tennis and she goes, why don't we try out this church? And we just walked around the bend and somebody from the school came and, and said, hey, you guys, you guys should come sometime. This is great. And uh, so I think we came the following week and we've been here ever since. And Circe's saved. She got saved at this church and, and, and baptized and we got baptized together. And, and Pastor and, and Mrs. T, you guys have just been the most amazing people to us and everybody at this church has been so welcoming and so loving and and just we we can't we can't thank you guys enough for everything you've done for us and your family everyone here is family we love you all thank you so much for everything they're a sweet couple i have that i had him give his testimony because he added it this book for mrs treber he spent a lot of time on it. She'd write it, and then he'd edit it. Uh, Searcy's a, um, the head nurse on the fourth floor, cardiac care. She's a brilliant lady, brilliant, smart, nurse of the month many times a year, a large hospital here. But, you know, I, I had that Miss Treber help us, and she gave the, the book because um, I, I don't stay up with them like I should. But the first thing she said, you need Bibles. And so she bought them Bibles. And then she said, you need Brother Becker's. Where's Brother Stephen Becker? She goes, you need his book, how to read the Bible together, how to study the Bible. And they do it twice a day, still do, for these last eight months, I guess. And they're just going through those books and studying them and reading them. They come Sunday school, Sunday, they're in our class, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And it's wonderful to see Saturday night men's prayer, soul winning. But it, it, Ms. Treber tell you this, and the, I, this is not, I, I have not done hardly what I, I love them, but she talks to them every day. And that's what it takes, yeah. how are things going. And they see her, I think, as a mother figure, perhaps, and me as a grandfather figure. And um, <laughs> I'm not gonna do this every night, that's the only presentation all week long, but God's doing something for us these days. We can't get our buses going like we want to. Our buses were at 800, 900. There, yesterday, four, was it 450? I can't remember. Nursing homes were pretty strong yesterday, about 150. Uh, we don't count that on our attendance, but they were strong yesterday. Bus B and Bus C, Spanish was strong yesterday, packed out over there. This place is packed every Sunday morning. The balcony, the lower floor, visitors galore, everywhere. God's doing something. We're seeing folks saved. But we're not kicking on all eight cylinders. The offerings, you'll be happy about this, all year are down. I heard Bobby Robertson one time said, you know, you stay long enough, you'll have some years the offerings go down and some years they go up. Now our building expansion is going really strong right now, but we want the general to get strong again too. Those things happen. Sometimes the buses are down, sometimes they're up. Just stay faithful. I've taken a lot of time. We'll get to preaching momentarily. Let's stand together and sing page number 260 with Brother Martinez. Page 260, we'll get ready for preaching in just a minute. My God is real. You can put that in your heart. That's 260, and there are some things I may not know. But I'm sure, but I'm sure of this one thing. Look at this, look at this, that God is real.
Think of that. Remember that? Oh, but since that day, but since Miracle story on a Saturday morning, bus workers came by, knocked on the door from an unsaved home. And I, I won't tell you the story because perhaps in his preaching he may. And God, God did something. I will say this, the church was in Chattanooga that sent the bus. The pastor was Dr. Lee Robertson who sent the bus. And thank God for the bus ministry. And it still works. What a great man of God. He and his wife who's here tonight, somewhere right down here. And to thank God for them from Georgia. They have a beautiful family, grown daughters, and both married. They're in the ministry, and their kids, grandkids. Just It's just a wonderful place. And the big camp meeting is coming up here in just a couple more weeks. And a powerful preacher. He was with us this year at our soul winning clinic for adults. We had about 700 on a Saturday for three hours in the gymnasium where he just taught us. And you know, that was just back in January and it caught hold. And we're always a soul winning church, but I tell you, people are witnessing all the time and giving the gospel. And it works, just giving the gospel. Uh, and I thank God for Brother Gravel. You're going to really enjoy him preaching in just a few moments. Brother Martinez, if you'll come and you'll sing for us and then the preacher tonight, you come if you will. Um, uh, seriously, if you'll just run around to that back there, the ushers will help you. I need to have you go right back there if you will, and that'll be good. Good, okay, good. And Brother brother, uh, brother Slice, uh, one of our, and get a doctor right there too. That'll be good. All right. Jesus, 
this situation here so let me make some announcements so all of our attention can be on preaching I want to just tell you about a few things that I have here tonight you're you're gonna want to be part of the heritage series books these books are so incredible all different color Jonathan Edwards and that's been a uh, out for a few years Adoniram Judson America's first missionary your kids ought to have these you ought to have them you ought to read them Sankey's stories of how he wrote these great hymns. He wrote Hold the Fort in Rockford, Illinois one day. And uh, this is a book, it's a two-part book. The second part comes out in the summer of 2024. It's $15. This is, Brother Reamers, if you'll come and tell us about it. This is one of the most incredible reads I've ever had. It's a reprint from, Gold, uh, from our ministry here. It's out of print. Come and tell us about what this is. Fifty Evenings with Moody is a book that uh, documents and details the revival that D.L. Moody had in New York City. And he, he rented P.T. Barnum's stadium, the Hippodrome. You'll see a picture of it here in the book. And the Hippodrome was built for the circus, but God used it to send a great revival in New York City. And Moody preached 50 nights straight in that location. And these are his messages. And this is 25. The second volume will have the next 25. They're on great, great topics. I think you'll enjoy them. They're easy to read, challenging, and uh, something that you'd enjoy to have in your library. We want you to stop by all the different booths and the, the shops at the convention center. But uh, this is one item I mentioned. We also mentioned already the, the uh, book from uh, Mrs. Treber that just came out. The beginning is the old part of our lives when we, you know, before we had children, then children, and then the latter part. I always push this every year. This book sells, maybe one of the number one sellers. It's every page is a chapter. It's written by J.C. Penney in 1956. I am an American. Patriotism. The golden rule. Obedience. Respect. Work. Every, I, I, I read it all the time. I've read it, reread it, reread it, reread it. We wanted to print it for years, and the J.C. Penney family would not allow us to, but we have it now. It's printed, and it just goes off the shelves. It is a great, a great, great read, and so I hope that you'll uh, get it. It's out there for $15, I think. Uh, the, 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 the importance of learning to fail, responsibility, the joy of sharing our Bible, knowing God, trustworthiness, uh, using your spare time, just uh, your mate, 
optimism, how to be a leader, a loyal man. Uh, there is section after section. America is no accident. Accident. America's creed, loyalty to God and to man, America's destiny. You need to get this book. This book is reprinted about four or five runs now. It's also in Spanish, Truths for Teens. When our children were in high school, I preached every week on a teenager in the Bible. And uh, that is in this book here. Uh, a, um, and they're all the letter S, a youth and his salvation. Uh, all teenagers in the Bible. A youth and his siblings, a youth and his song, a youth and her sorrow, her spirit, her spiritual life, her standards, her, a youth and his stewardship, his summer, his submission, his scriptures, his stability, his supplication, seeking God, surrender, serving God, a youth that sins, a youth in soul winning, a youth standing, a youth suffering, a youth su a sweating, a youth sidetracked, a youth who was spoiled, stirred to action. And um, there's other chapters in there. I hope you'll get that. Lastly, Brother Reimers, this that I'll say we'll get preaching up. Leaders of Men tonight, how much is this? 35 for all three volumes. We've given them to every, we've given them to the mayor, the city council, the chief of police, and it'd be a great Christmas gift. It's uh, the leaders in 1901. And my pastor gave me the book. It was one volume. We made it three volumes. And it talks from the post office general. It speaks, uh, it speaks of his testimony. It speaks of presidents. And they all give their history and then a message like duty is in here and how to fail is in here. And the, uh, the importance of an idea is in here. Business leaders, postmaster general. And so I hope you'll get that. Well, we're, I think we've taken care of it. You know, it's wonderful to pastor a church like this. We, I saw doctors, several doctors get up and went right out there. We have, I think 70, we counted one time, 75 or 80 that are in healthcare as nurses and doctors. And so I'm looking forward to getting sick one day, and uh, they'll they'll take they taking care of it. Everything's okay. We'll work on that, and that'll be good. Brother Grab, are you ready now? Yes, sir. We well, better be ready because we're ready. God's people said, "Amen." You ready? Amen. Come on, my brother. Amen. 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 Bless the preacher. Amen. Well, if I wasn't nervous, I'm nervous now. Amen. And uh, boy, I haven't you enjoyed all the singing tonight? I tell you, it's been so good. I. Uh, I like to sing inspiration. Amen. That was wonderful. And uh, certainly enjoyed that and the presence of God in the foyer. If you feel the presence of God in the foyer of a Baptist church, you know you're in a good place. Amen. And uh, then come in here tonight and uh, the good choir singing and all the testimony, special songs. And I love Pastor Treber and, and Sister Treber. Amen. Their spirit. Amen. And uh, this great church. And thank God uh, for this place and what it stands for. And uh, I tell you, thank God for a place that has not changed down through the years. Amen. And I uh, certainly do appreciate and am honored and humbled for the opportunity just to be here tonight. And I want you to take your Bibles, if you wouldn't, go with me to John chapter number 19. John chapter 19. And I'll be honest with you, I was uh, praying. Uh, I don't remember if it was, uh, you know, when you get up at 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning to get someplace. You don't know, you know, I don't know what day it was. I started praying, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. But... Uh, I was praying about what to preach on my way over here, and uh, it just seemed like this text stayed on my heart all day, uh, and maybe through the night, who knows what it was, but uh, I tell you, it's just stuck with me, and then the singing tonight, everything just seemed like it just connected, and so I pray the Lord to use it these next few moments to be a help and encouragement to us. If you're able to stand with us in reverence to the Word of God in prayer, John uh, chapter 19, we read a few verses of scripture and pray, and then you can be seated. Verse number one, John 19 and verse number one. The Bible said, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe, and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Father, I pray tonight in Jesus' name that you would take the message and speak to our hearts tonight. 
Help us to receive with meekness the engrafted word. And I pray that you'd open our eyes that we would behold wondrous things in thy law tonight. I ask you, Lord, tonight that you would get glory and honor, that you'd be magnified, that your son would be glorified in the church, would be edified tonight. Help us, Lord, give us that wisdom that we need for this hour. May we not say or do anything that would grieve the Holy Spirit in any way. And I pray most of all that we would see no man save Jesus only. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated tonight. I want you to notice with me in this text a word that is found two different times. It's found in verse number four, and then it's mentioned again in verse number five, and it's the word behold. And I'm sure tonight if you're a Bible reader of any length of time, you know and you've heard preaching on that word and what it means and what it represents. It means to stop and to think about. It means to fasten your eyes upon. It means to gaze upon. And there's a lot of things in this text tonight that we can behold. For example, if you go back to verse number one, we can behold the cruelty. As the Bible said that Pilate therefore took Jesus and he scourged him. Now that's a small verse, but it's a very significant verse because when you think about the most of the blood that was shed, uh, was shed at the scourging post and at the cross. And so we can behold the cruelty in verse number one. And then we could also tonight in verse number two, behold the crown as the Bible said that uh, in verse number two, the soldiers planted a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and we can behold the crown tonight. We can behold the clothing in verse number two as the Bible said that they put on him a purple robe and this robe was to mock him. It was a symbol of royalty and certainly Christ was worthy to wear that robe, amen? Because he was royalty, amen? But the soldiers put that crown or put that crown of thorns and that purple robe and, and we can behold the clothing. Much can be said about the purple robe. It is mentioned again in verse number five and then we could also in verse number three, we can behold his critics as the Bible said that they said, hail king of the Jews and they smote him with their hands. And, and you think about the cruelty that Christ went through as the soldiers surrounded him, they spit upon him, they smote him. I mean, Jesus endured a lot before he ever got to the cross. We could behold the critics. Our Lord had critics and every child of God that lives for God will have critics in this life. And then we can behold the confession. Look what Pilate says in verse number four. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto him, behold, I bring him forth to you that, I may, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Now, Pilate didn't just say this once, but if you go back to verse number six, uh, uh, look down in verse six, he says it a second time. Pilate knew how to intimidate a man. He, he knew how to interrogate a man, and he knew very well how to investigate a man. But he never met a man like this man. I'm gonna tell you, Pilate, put him under the microscope. Uh, uh, listen, the chief priests, uh, uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they put him under the microscope of the law. Pilate put him under the microscope uh, and Pilate came up with this one conclusion. I find no fault in him. I'm gonna tell you something, friend, there'll never be a generation that'll ever find any fault in Jesus Christ, amen? I'm telling you, after 2,000 years, uh, uh, we can still testify that they cannot find a fault in him. You know why? Because there is no fault in him. Him. Amen. He is perfect. He is sinless. He is righteous. He is holy. Amen. He is just. He is everything that we ever thought him to be and so much more. Amen. And Pilate makes that great confession. I find no fault in him. And then we could behold the, the Christ. Notice what Pilate said in verse number five. He and Pilate saith unto them, behold the man. Certainly we could preach on that tonight. Because Jesus was every much man, but he was every much God. Isn't that right? He's the son of God, but he was the son of man. He is the incarnate Christ, amen? He was God in the flesh, personified in the flesh. God the Father is a spirit. And the Bible said in the book of Colossians that in him, talking about Jesus, all the fullness of the Godhead dwelleth bodily, amen? God literally poured himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is not just like God, but Jesus is God, amen? Moses, when he come off the Mount of Transfiguration, 
and the glory of God shined off his face and they had to put a veil over him. But Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, it was not a reflection that was coming off his face. Uh, he literally prayed himself into the glory and the image of the Father ran out of his face uh, and the glory of God, uh, his humanity gave way to his deity. Why? Because Christ is the God man. Amen. We could behold the man tonight. You can behold him all throughout these scriptures, can't you? But tonight I want to notice one thing in particular. It's mentioned twice in this text. I want to behold the crown. Notice the Bible said in verse number two, and the soldiers platted a crown of thorns. Then verse five said, then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns. I want to preach a few minutes tonight on the crowns of Jesus. The crowns of Jesus. The soldiers said in this text in verse number three, Hail, King of the Jews. And I, I want to testify tonight that Jesus was and still is the King of the Jews. Amen. But he's not just the king of the Jews. He is the king of the ages, amen. He's the king of heaven and he's the king of hell and he's the king of glory. He's the king invisible. He's the king immortal, amen. He's the king of kings. He, he's the Lord of lords. Uh, he's that which is, which was, which is to come. He's the almighty, saith the Lord, amen. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the root of David, amen. Uh, I'm telling you, listen, he is everything. Uh, listen, he is God. Amen. He is the door and he is the way and he is the truth and he is the life. He is the good shepherd and he is the great shepherd and he is my shepherd and he is the chief shepherd. David said he's my buckler and my shield. He's my strong and mighty tower. He's the song of the church and he's the shepherd of the valley and he's the wheel inside the wheel. I don't. I didn't intend to say it but I'm not sorry that I did. Amen. He's a stone hewn out of the rock. Daniel said he's the fourth man in the fire. I'm telling you he just just everything. Uh, my friend, he's the great storyteller. Uh, he's the resurrection and he's the life. Uh, and he is the door. Uh, he is everything. Uh, he is God in the flesh. Uh, he's all powerful. He's almighty. He just is tonight. Amen. He's king, isn't he? And every king has a crown. And when I think about crowns and, and when we consider crowns tonight, they represent something. A crown represents power, amen. And a crown represents uh, uh, prestige. Uh, a crown represents, it can represent popularity and it represents prosperity. Those that wear a crown, these things accompany that, those crowns. I want us to think about the crowns of Jesus because there's three crowns in this or in this. Uh, scriptures that I want to look at tonight. And I want us to consider the first crown here in John chapter number 19. And I would call this crown tonight the crown of mockery. Because this crown does not represent any of the things that the other crowns that we just mentioned represent. There is no power, there is no prestige, there is no popularity. No one is standing in line to wear the crown that Jesus is wearing in our text tonight. There is, uh, this crown does not represent prosperity. You say, Brother Gravely, what does it represent? This crown tonight represents sin, amen? In Genesis chapter three, when God cursed the earth, uh, uh, the Bible said that that curse of the earth uh, uh, caused the ground to bring forth thorns and thistles. Uh, and the Bible said that the soldiers platted a crown of thorns uh, and they placed it upon his head. This is a crown of mockery. This is an earthly crown. This crown was given to him by sinners uh, and this crown represents sin, amen? It represents shame. It represents sorrow. It represents suffering. This crown crown is the opposite of any other crown that like we have ever known. But yet Jesus wore this crown. I thought about that preacher. Jesus never did sin because he could not sin. He's wearing a crown that represents sin, but he could not sin. If he could have sinned then, that would mean that he could sin now. But he is the sinless son of God. 
He was born into a world that was full of sin. He was born amongst sinners. Uh, As a child, he played with sinners. Uh, He grew up around sinners. Uh, He lived with sinners. Uh, He worked as a young man with sinners. He went to church with sinners. Uh, He preached to sinners. Uh, He healed sinners. Uh, He taught sinners. Uh, He fed sinners. Uh, He he sat down with sinners. Uh, He even died amongst sinners. Uh, But the greatest thing about our Lord is that he was not a sinner, amen? I'm telling you, Jesus Christ uh, is sinless, amen? And then our Lord never brought any shame to his name. This crown represents sin. It represents shame. Christ knew no sin. Christ never did anything that was shameful. This crown represents suffering. Jesus never caused anyone to suffer. He never brought suffering upon anyone. During his 33 and a half years living in this world, he didn't do anything but help people and heal people and was a blessing to people. When I think about this crown, it's almost like this crown does not fit. This is a crown of sin and suffering and shame and it's a crown of sorrow. Jesus was known for taking away sorrow. You might say tonight, then why is Jesus wearing this crown? Because it wasn't his crown. You know whose crown this was tonight? I want to say tonight, this was my crown. And this is your crown tonight. You see, this crown uh, represents everything that we are. This crown, my friend, represents everything that we should have endured. It should have been us tonight. You see, it was our sin. It was our shame. It was our sorrow. It was our suffering. Yet they put it on the head of our very Savior, our lovely Lord. And Jesus never took it off. He wore it all the way through the streets of Jerusalem to the brow of Calvary's hillside. He walked the Via Della Rosa every step of the way wearing our crown crown. Jesus wore the crown of mockery. Amen. Took my sin, my sorrow, my suffering, my shame. The Bible says in verse number one that Pilate therefore took Jesus and he scourged him. History tells us that most men died at the scourging post. They would take a man that was known as a, a lictor. He was skilled in, in the scourging aspect and they would, take a, a, they would take a criminal out to what would be known as the rack or three iron pillars in some cases and they would take leather straps and they would, they would tie his hands down, stretching his arms out, pulling all the tendons and the muscles and tightening everything as tight as they could get it. And they would bow his head over that rack and tie him down. And that lictor would take what was known as a flagellum we call it the cat of nine tails uh, uh, with iron, sharp iron and rock and different pieces of objects uh, uh, that were sharpened, uh, strategically tied on uh, uh, to take away the skin. And that lictor would take uh, and skillfully begin to peel away. Now Jesus was not uh, a crucifier, was not scourged by Jews, uh, but he was scourged by Romans, amen? And Jews could only give 39 stripes, uh, but Romans could give as many stripes as they wanted to. Nowhere's in the Bible. Bible. Does it say that Jesus received 39 stripes? In fact, we don't know how much scourging our Lord took at the post that day. But we do know the Bible says in Psalms 129 and verse number three that the plowers plowed long furrows in his back. Amen. What that means is, is that more than one man scourged Jesus. I want you to get this image in your mind for just a moment. History tells us that most men would gnaw off their tongue at the scourging post because of the agony and the pain. 90% of the blood would be lost there at the scourging post. Our Lord, they took him and they stretched him out. And what that lictor would do is take that flagellum and for just the sake of argument, if he received 39 stripes, uh, he would start on the right shoulder blade and he would work his way from the top of that shoulder down to the bottom of his rib cage, uh, giving 13 stripes. Uh, Then he would go to the left shoulder and give 13 more stripes. Uh, And then in the middle of the back, he would work his 
way around the spinal column and very strategically he would pull out the intricles and the organs just enough uh, to expose them so that they could be seen. I mean, this was a crucia, a very gruesome sight. Uh, no wonder Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, who is on sin, bear our, or who is on self, bear our sins uh, in his own body on the tree, that being dead to sin, we should live unto righteousness uh, by whose stripes we are healed. Amen. You know what Peter does? Uh, he links the tree, Calvary, and he links the, the scourging post together of all the tortures that Christ went through. When you think about the scourging and you think about the cross, uh, uh, Jesus went through all of this for you. He went through all of this for me. And all the while, guess what? He's wearing that crown, uh, that crown of sin, that crown of sorrow, that crown of suffering, that crown of shame. Uh, our Lord uh, is wearing that crown. He wore it all the way. In fact, hanging on the cross, naked before all the world to see, with not a stitch of clothing on his body, the shame that he bore at Calvary. And the only thing he wore while he hung on the cross was this crown, a past crown, a cr earthly crown, a crown that was given to him by sinners. Go with me to Hebrews chapter number two for just a moment. I want to read one verse, a great verse. I like the way this verse opens up. Hebrews 2 in verse number 9 says, but we see Jesus. You know, it's going to be a great day when we see Jesus. What rapture don't, or what revival don't fix down here, rapture is going to take care of up there. And I do believe we're going to see Jesus. And the Bible says here, but we see Jesus. I want you to notice a second crown here. And I want you to see Jesus in this text. I, I call this the crown of majesty. The Bible says, but we see Jesus, notice his humanity, his name, Jesus, that's his earthly name. Speaking of his humanity, notice his humility. He was made a little lower than the angels. Uh, notice his hurt for the suffering of death and then his honor. He was crowned with glory and honor. Look at his help that he, by the grace of God, I wanna stop and say this, if the grace of God is, is real enough at, for Christ at Calvary, the grace of God will be real enough for you and I, for whatever we face in this life, amen? And then we see his heroism as the Bible said that he tasted death uh, uh, for every man. Now think about this second crown here. The Bible said, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. That first crown is a past crown. He'll never wear that crown again. And because he wore that crown, We'll never wear that crown. It's forever gone. It's past. The sin is gone. The shame is gone. The sorrow has been taken away. All the suffering is gone. That crown was an earthly crown given to him by sinners. This is not a past crown, but this is a present crown. And this is not an earthly crown, but thank God it's an eternal crown. This is not a crown given to him by sinners, but somebody else gave him this crown. No sinner was worthy to crown him in verse number nine. No angel was worthy to crown him in verse number nine. I would explain it like this. If you remember on the mount that day when Jesus is fixing to ascend back into heaven, he has told the disciples that he is going away and their hearts are saddened as they're standing there. Uh, the victorious resurrection has taken place uh, and now questions are flooding their minds uh, as they wonder what this world is going to be like, what their life is going to be like now that Jesus is going back to heaven and they're standing there with him that day 
on that mountain as he begins to ascend back up into the heavens uh, and all the sadness that must have been in their heart uh, as they watched him, uh, as the clouds took him out of their sight uh, and the angels spoke and said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into the heavens? Uh, long after he is gone, uh, they just kept on looking, uh, hoping that somehow he might come back very, very soon. Uh, they said this same Jesus uh, that you've seen go up into heaven uh, shall so come in like manner. Amen. I'm going to tell you just any day now, our Lord is coming, friend. The clouds are going to roll back like a scroll, and the sky is going to surrender to the Shekinah glory of another world. And Jesus is coming again. Hallelujah. I can see them. Their heart is saddened. They walk down that mountain that day together. Probably very slow and very sad. But as God pulled back the veil that day on the ascension, though there was sadness on this side, <laughs> there was anticipation like never before in eternity on the other side. I'm gonna tell you, when God closed that curtain on this world, there was a celebration fixing to take place on the other side, amen. For something, for 33 and a half years, the throne, there had been a vacancy in it the Son of God had been gone. I don't know how it took place. I don't know what all took place. I believe there was an excitement. I believe there was an anticipation. I believe there was a rejoicing. I believe heaven's choir stood at attention. I believe every Old Testament patriarch was standing there waiting for just any moment the trumpet to sound, for the gates of glory to lift up, for the Son of God was fixing to come home. Amen. He was coming back. It was crowning day in glory. The work had been finished. The price had been paid. The lamb had been slain. The debt was paid in full. The altar had been satisfied. The blood was on the mercy seat. And the son was coming home. Hallelujah. I believe, my friend, as Jesus made his way through the portals of glory, there had to be a shout that rang out through the heavens. Angelic voice a mix with my friend the voice of the immortals that have been saved by looking at the cross by faith as they rejoice as the victor, the conqueror, the one and only was coming home. Hallelujah. <laughs> About to think myself happy. And uh, Jesus makes his way to the throne. I don't know how this happened. Come on. But there's only one in heaven that would have been worthy right. to have crowned him with glory and honor. Yes. Brother, as he makes his way past the mercy seat to the right hand of the Father, I believe God the Father crowned God the Son. As the Bible said that he gave him a name that was above every name. And declared that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And every tongue should confess uh, of things in heaven and things. Wouldn't you like to have been there when that declaration was made? Uh, when God the Father stood and said, uh, I just want to make an announcement uh, uh, through the portals of glory uh, uh, that I've given him a name uh, that is now above every name. Uh, that at the name of Jesus, uh, every knee is going to bow of things in heaven, uh, things in earth, uh, and things under the earth. Uh, and that every tongue shall confess uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Woo, praise God. I'm going to tell you, if I wasn't even saved, I'd shout over that. And God the Father crowned God the Son. And I'll tell you what that crowning said, well done. Well done. Crown of majesty and an eternal crown given by a sovereign God. 
This is a present crown. Jesus wears this crown right now. He is at the right hand of the Father. The Bible said he ever liveth to make intercession for you and me. And isn't it a blessing to know tonight that even though he's sitting there at the right hand of the Father, that my friend, he's still got me and you on his mind. Amen. I'm telling you, as he bore the crown of, of thorns at Calvary, he bore us on his mind at the cross, uh, but he bears us on his mind in glory right now. I don't know who all's prayed for you, and you don't know all who all's prayed for me, but I know one that's prayed for every one of us. Amen. He prayed for us this morning. He's praying for us right now. Amen. You might be here and say, I don't know if anybody prays for you or prays for me. I'll tell you the one that counts the most is praying for you. Amen. The one that's had every prayer answered and the one that's closest to the Father, the one that never has a prayer that ever fails. He prays for me and he prays for you and he's crowned with glory and he's crowned with honor. He's crowned with majesty. He's He's wearing that crown, hallelujah. I see not only the crown of mockery and the crown of majesty. I want you to notice one final crown. Go with me to Revelation 19. That first crown, it's an earthly crown, a past crown. He'll never wear that crown again. It represents sin, sorrow, shame, suffering. It was given to him by sinners. The second crown is a present crown. It is an eternal crown that was given to him by a sovereign God. It represents majesty and glory and honor, but think about this crown. I like the way Revelation 19 and verse 11 begins. And I saw heaven open. <laughs> you know what's gonna happen when heaven opens? Hebrews 2, 9, we're gonna see Jesus. <laughs> Wouldn't it be good if heaven opened right now? John said, I saw heaven open and he that sat upon it, behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he did judge and make war and his eyes were as a flame of fire and notice this, on his head were many crowns. I want you to think about the crown of many. We see the crown of mockery. We see the crown of majesty. But what about the crown of many? You see, if when we come to this chapter, uh, chapter number 19 of Revelation, we know that in this chapter, there is the four hallelujahs. There's the marriage supper of the Lamb, and there's the battle of Armageddon. We know, I remember years ago hearing uh, Dr. Lee Robertson preach that famous message on beauty, battle, and the beast, amen? And he talked about the battle of Armageddon. And we know that, my friend, at the end of the tribulation period, uh, when the Antichrist has rallied all the truth, and convince this world and the armies of this world and the captains and the kings of this world that they can do battle against the Son of God. They'll fill that Jezreel Valley, that Valley of Jehoshaphat. They'll fill that valley one day during the, in the plains of Megiddo, army after army, to do battle against the Son of God. But we know it will not be to any avail. Amen. For the Bible said here that Jesus is gonna come back. He's coming on a white horse. Amen. And when he comes, he's not coming by himself. Self. Amen. The Bible said a few verses later, the armies uh, which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Uh, hey, you better get ready to saddle up. Amen. Because uh, there's coming a day when every blood washed saint of God, uh, we're going to follow our king of glory. Uh, as my friend, the st I believe the horses are already pawing in the stables right now. Uh, and thank God the army of God uh, is getting ready. Uh, this world hadn't seen the last of us. Uh, we are coming again. We're coming with the king. Uh, we're coming with the captain. Captain, we're coming, my friend, with him. And he's gonna, my friend, shake this world when he comes. Him Jews will have run to that rose red city. And our Lord, my friend, the Bible says in this chapter that out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. That with it he'll smite the nations. The blood will flow to the horse's bridle. And the Bible says a nation is gonna be born in a day. <laughs> He's gonna light off that stallion and put his feet on the Mount of Olives. And the word of God said it's gonna split from east to west. He's gonna come walking down through that valley and them Jews are gonna come out of Petra and they're gonna see him coming with the blood dripping from his robe, his vesture, and written on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And on his head, many crowns. They're gonna see him and they're gonna cry Baha Mashiach, which means come old Jehovah. When they're gonna see him, the scales are gonna fall off their eyes. 
the one that wore their crown, they'll see him that day. I'll tell you what's so good about that, we'll be with him, hallelujah. I don't know if we'll be circling the, the heavens, but I'll tell you, we'll be somewhere having a time, amen. The Bible said on his head were many crowns. Where did he get all them crowns? That first crown was given to him by sinners, earthly crown. Sin, suffering, shame, and sorrow, he'll never wear that again past crown. That second crown was given to him by a sovereign God. Nobody worthy to give him that crown. Crown with glory and honor. That's a present crown. Majesty, glory, and honor. He's wearing it right now. But this crown, these crowns, these many crowns, amen. And these many crowns that he's wearing, they wasn't given to him by sinners and they wasn't given to him by a sovereign God. You say, where'd he get all them crowns? I'll tell you where he got them. He got them from his, from his bride. He got them from the saints. He got them from you and he got them from me. One of these days, hey, you know the only thing better than preaching Jesus is crowning Jesus, amen? And one of these days, Revelation 4 said they cast their crowns at his feet. I'm telling you, friend, I wanna cast my crowns, don't you? At the lovely feet of the one that wore our crown. He wore our crown. I want to give him a crown back in return. I want to my friend bless him for blessing us. I thought about that. I thought, how, I thought Brother Tony, how's Jesus going to wear all them crowns? I mean, how's he going to wear all? He's wearing many of them. And I know that word means diadem, but don't come tell me that after church because you'll mess my sermon up. Some second year college student said, you know that? Now be quiet. I thought, how's he going to wear all them crowns? I don't know how it'll happen. But this sure makes good preaching. <laughs> We're going to cast our crowns, the Bible says, at his feet. You know, there's five crowns you can win. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said, henceforth there's later for me what? crown of righteousness. There's an incorruptible crown, 1 Corinthians 9. There's a crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians talks about a crown of life, James talks about a crown of glory, 1 Peter 5. Those crowns. I don't know how he's going to wear all them crowns. But wouldn't it be good to be in a crown in service? Wouldn't it be good if in heaven if, if they called Brother Martinez up here and said, Brother Martinez, we, we're going to let you crown Jesus. He's going to wear Brother Martinez's crown. Then he's going to wear Brother Treber's crown. The only thing better than preaching Jesus would be crowning him. And I thought about those five crowns. God's measuring stick for our life, you know what it is? It's faithfulness. Because our life is going to be put in the fire, the Bible says. And the fire is going to try every work, notice this, of what sort it is. So let's take this sermon tonight. It's not just the fact that I'm preaching a sermon and preaching truth. Well, that would be worthy, that'd be a good work. No, the fire is going to try of what sort. What's the motive of my preaching tonight? If the motive was to be seen, if the motive was recognition, if the motive was anything other than the glory of God, it'll be ashes at the judgment seat. If I preach to get another appointment, if I preach to be seen, it's ashes. There'll be a lot of singing, a lot of preaching, a lot of working going to burn up at the judgment seat. And when all that's done, there are going to be people. You know, faithfulness is not something people put a premium on today. If you're a pastor, you know that. They don't mind missing Wednesday night prayer meeting for Little League. They don't mind missing Sunday school. They don't mind missing Sunday. Faithfulness to a lot, to a lot of people, it just doesn't matter that much. It's, it's almost as if they've become desensitized to it. Preacher mentioned earlier, no Sunday night services in a lot of places. There's a lot of unfaithfulness today, isn't there? But when we get to heaven, and I really believe there's going to be people there, they're saved, they're saved as you and I are. 
or when their life is put into the fire, they're going to sift through the ashes. Because I think one of the most terrifying, or should I say one of the most heartbreaking things to ever see at the judgment seat would be to look into the face of the one and right above his eye to see the thorn-pierced brow and see where Jesus wore that. He wore that. I'll see. I'll see the very place where he wore my crown and there'll be people sift through the ashes because of a life of unfaithfulness. They won't have a crown to give him. See, the Lord is not going to look at any of us and say, well done, thou good and talented servant. Well done, thou good and successful servant. He's not going to say that to none of us. No, God has one measuring stick tonight. And the good thing about that stick is it doesn't matter if you pastor 50 or 500. This matters if you're faithful. It doesn't matter if your Sunday school class is, is 20 people or, or if it's 200 people. It doesn't matter if you can teach a good lesson or if you fall on your face next Sunday after studying as hard as you can. No, that's not what it's all about. No, that's not what the fire is going to try. Was you there? Was you faithful? It's not the success. It's not the results, and we all like it, but it's the, was you faithful? I think about men of God down through the years that have so influenced my life. When I, when I look at them, yes, God used them, but God used them all in different ways and so many different things could be said about their life. And, and some of them I remember when, when, when their life, when, when their ministries were just flourishing and other times I remember when their ministry wasn't flourishing. But there's one thing that seemed to always flourish amongst everything else in all of their life. You know what it was? They were just faithful. Just faithful to the end. Just faithful. You know, I can't be a whole lot, but by the grace of God, don't you want to finish and be faithful? Pastor, I don't know what number, or how, what, what you're going through. I don't know what the size of your church is. Preacher's wife, I, I don't know what you, you've come to this meeting needing. I don't know what you're looking for. I don't know what you're needing. But, but I'll tell you one thing. If you can go home and just determine to be faithful, just determine to stay, just determine to stick in, just determine to keep pressing on, you say, why? Because there's a judgment seat. And at that judgment seat, if you'll be faithful, I promise you, shining through the ashes of a life that has been put in the fire, you'll find a crown that one day you can cast at his feet because you've been faithful. Amen. You've been faithful. And I want to hear the Lord say, well done. I ain't always done well, but I like for him to hear him say, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. You know, at Calvary, I see the faithfulness of our Lord. At the right hand of the Father in intercessory prayer, I see the faithfulness of our Lord. And even though this has not transpired yet, in the end to the nation of Israel and to his bride, we see the faithfulness of our Lord. You know the one thing that God really, that touches his heart. He gave us what talents and abilities we have. That's not what touches him. But the one thing that touches his heart is when we just keep pressing on. Faithfulness. I wonder tonight as we stand, could you determine tonight that come what may, Lord, give me the grace to just be faithful. Bus worker, it's never been about the numbers. And thank God for them. But God needs you to be faithful. He needs you to get on that bus every Saturday to go back to those same houses, that same neighborhood, those same years, and keep knocking them same doors and getting those same children. Sunday school teacher, your class just needs you to be faithful. Choir member, be faithful. Preacher, be faithful. Preacher's wife, 
I know sometimes your heart gets heavy. But press on. Be faithful. Because in the end, we won't remember any of these things, these accolades, or we won't remember any. Heaven's going to be all about Him. But He will remember whether or not we were faithful. Don't sell out. Don't back up. Don't compromise. Don't give in. Be faithful as they play for us. If you need to come, you obey God. You don't have to come, but if you, if you need to come, you ought to come tonight. If He speaks to you, you obey him tonight. either one of you uh, if you're here we'll have one of you lead us in prayer I don't know if they're in here right now I know they are Our Father, we're thankful for what we've heard here tonight. <clears throat> well, I believe we, we saw the touch of God in a man's life this evening. And I thank you for it. Thank you for Pastor Bradley, his dear sweet wife, that have uh, come all the way across the country today to help us. We've been so helped tonight. I thank you for our friends that are here. And God, please. Please, if you would, give them good rest tonight. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Brother Cox is here. He's going to pray. Ask God's blessing on this week. Heavenly Father, thank you for what we've heard already tonight. And Lord, we want to be faithful. Lord, my heart's been stirred tonight, and I thank you for all the good singing and the testimonies, and Lord, for the good preaching that lifted up Jesus. Thank you for this meeting tonight, and God, may you bless every preacher, every teacher, every singer, every musician. May the hand of God work in this meeting this week and people leave changed and revived and stirred up to win souls and do something for God, we pray. Thank you for Brother Treber and his vision and his heart and compassion. And we thank you, Lord, for what you do for us. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. I'm so thankful that he's here. He'll be preaching this week. and been flying all day just got in right right from the airport to here at the beginning of the service please be seated we're 8 33 8 34 good time we're going to go eat in just a moment and brother flood is uh, in charge of this week he's in charge of activities and all big events uh, easter sunday is going to be uh, it's going to be amazing around here and uh, he's the one in charge of, we're praying that god will give us ten thousand people on Easter, and last year he almost got there. So he said, well, that's just numbers. I know it's just numbers, but there's a book of the Bible called Numbers. And uh, he's, he, he's, I don't know how to organize it like that. I don't know how to do it like that. Uh, the youth conference, he knows how to do it. And, and this conference here, you know, 
I have prayed and I've tried to, and I come up with ideas. But, but I say this to you, if you're staff members or deacons or ushers, I have many good ideas. But I'll implement those ideas. God's given me people all around me in the, in the church, deacons, ushers, Sunday school teachers, bus workers. I came up with this great idea. Let's make this into a mall. Let's have about four roads over there. Let's have Lee Robertson Road in the gymnasium tonight. And I watched our people build things. And I, it's just an amazing thing what they've done for you, trying to make it good for you. And uh, I, if you could go home, and it's no telling what could happen if you'd lift his hands. Your pastor, don't sit on his hands. Don't hurt him. Don't hurt your pastor. And I'll tell you what, I'm so, so blessed. Uh, and I remember holding him at the, at when he was born. I remember, I remember his parents getting married here. And uh, that, that's the joy of Stan. And uh, I can tell you this, I won't say this long. The end of the journey is the hardest. Lee Robertson taught me that. Jack Hiles taught me that. Bobby Robertson taught me that. Lester Roloff taught me that. The end is hardest, but it's the best. I'm having the best, my, we're, my wife and I, we're having the best time of our life. But it's more difficult, but the blessings are greater. Man like this. Brother Flood, come and make what announcement you have right now. Thank you, Pastor. I do get the joy and the fun of making conference announcements. It is going to be a great time. I will be very brief because we have food waiting for us uh, over in the dining hall. And we are trying this year to keep all of our delegates as we line up. You want to enter the convention center, either one of the doors or even that main lobby. And we're going to try to line up all inside. And there's, there's roped off. We're going to go to the doors if you've been here before then we're going to go into the convention center down that first aisle it's curtis hudson boulevard and you go down that first aisle and we'll line up that way and we'll kind of weave our way around the convention center as lined up in your packet you should have received some meal tickets and that is what's going to get you the meal tonight and so if you have that with you that'd be tremendous if you still need to register you can go to the registration booth in the convention center and if you have any questions you can go over there as well if you have your booklets if you can take it and turn to page number six and just briefly i'll mention the conference schedule and which for tremendous first night and tomorrow morning we'll meet again the breakfast our continental breakfast including your registration begins at 8 15 and we've moved the location of that breakfast normally it was in our academic building now that will be in the convention center as well over towards the back where all of those tables are set up and we have all of the breakfast tremendous uh, foods and different fruits and donuts and also coffee amen so that's our baptist drug that is approved all right here we go so we have all of that as well tonight also and so you can see the schedule i also want to mention after tomorrow morning after the delegate fellowship that, that breakfast at 8 15 uh, at 8.35, we're inviting our senior pastors and our missionaries and our evangelists to come over to the church staff offices over in the academic building. And if you need directions, you can ask anybody with a red lanyard. Uh, all of our volunteers and our staff, they're wearing the red lanyards. And so you can ask them questions. And if they don't know, let me know that they did not know that question. That would be yep, great. Yep, yep. And so that would be tremendous as well. But we're inviting our senior pastors. We have a gift that we'd like to get you. So tomorrow morning, 835, stop by. And it's actually in Pastor Treber's conference, uh, conference room there. And we'll take you through the staff offices, and that will be tremendous. Also, right after the first opening service, uh, we begin sessions at 10 o'clock. There's two different session hours, and those sessions are also listed in the conference booklets. You want to make sure you look at that and kind of have a game plan for where you're going. Maybe talk to the other people in your group and see where the different sessions are going to be and uh, which ones you like to attend so you have a game plan for that. Tonight, after the evening service as well, in the convention center, if you've noticed, we've mentioned the convention center a lot. It is a good place to be, but we also have another gift. North Valley Publications has a special gift for our senior pastors and missionaries over in the convention center. So make sure that you stop by that main area. This is a large area right underneath the basketball hoop. Make sure you stop by that to get your gift as well. Pastor, did I, mention, did I miss anything? I think that's it. That sounds good. Thank sounds you. Sounds good to me too. 
I'm excited about the gift that it's at the uh, North Valley Publications table. Brother Cal Vaughn, I've asked him to make a new CD. It's probably 15, 16 songs. We play it every night at dinner. I said, I want you to just continuous old hymns of the faith, just continuous, not high, not low, not fast, not slow, just great hymns of the faith. And we made a selection list, and he plays that. We listen, it's beautiful, uh, beautiful Christian music. So senior pastor, uh, Brother Johnson, my dear friend, that would be you, and Brother Rule, those you fellows, and all missionaries, I hope you'll stop by. We have that, it won't cost you anything. And it's every night we have something for you. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. I say, well, I'm tired in the morning. I'll sleep in. You can sleep the rest of your life. Don't sleep this week. It's everything. Everything is going to be so exciting. It's going to be so wonderful, so helpful. Uh, there's a, a Q&A card somewhere around here. At the registration booth. And on Wednesday, Ms. Trevor and I have the joy of every Wednesday we always have a Q&A time. And we'll take those cards. Don't don't sign it. Don't don't say my wife is giving me fits. What should I do? And then you sign your name. Do not sign your name. Any man could have. Well, we won't say that. But um, but but don't sign your name. You can if you want. But no, make sure it's a good question. If you would, I think that's everything. Let's stand together, if you will, as we do in our church. Would you take everything that's uh, the few the. Uh, Saw books right there. Will you straighten them up and put them back properly? In the convention center, uh, one of our artists here has made these coloring books. Take something home to your kids. This is um, the, the Bible and uh, uh, Living God's Word coloring book. And this is one. Let's go to church. It's this pulpit right here uh, drawn, and they can draw it. And take something home to kids. This is uh, adventure uh, with going to the mission field. Uh, there's Golden State Baptist Children's T-shirts there. Tomorrow night's the alumni dinner, so let's not forget about that. Tomorrow night afterwards, you see your booklet tonight. And um, you asked me, now I'm asking you, do we get it all? God bless you. Let's have prayer for the food. Brother Flood, lead us in prayer for the food, please. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the preaching of your word that we've heard tonight. And God, we thank you for the beginning of this great conference. I pray that you would use it for your honor and glory. And we do pray for the food, that it would be a great time of uh, fellowship and also nourishment as well. And God, we give you all the honor and praise. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we leave, could we have any staff members that are in the booths? Would you go? Could we get all the preachers, Brother Hudson, Brother Cox, uh, Brother Gravely, you and your wife, if you'll go with Brother Martinez right there. Brother Pusson, will you help help, help him if, if you will too. Um, Brother Gammons, we'll get you going as well. Let's get all the, Mr. Treber, if you, brother, get, get them going if you will. Let's let them get going. Of course, you people in the back are already leaving. They're hungry. God bless you. Might as well leave too. See ya.